Hello, and welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, where we take topics in business and in life and simplify them. And friends, I'm so excited to bring back one of my favorite guests from season two. Her name is Terry Cole, and I know you're going to recognize her voice as soon as she starts speaking because she is going to give us the real truth right now. And the topic we are simplifying today, I feel like a lot of us, okay, I'll put my hand up first, need to hear this right now, 2021, and it's how to stick to your boundaries. Now, Terry Cole, as you know, she is a licensed psychotherapist and a global empowerment expert. She's also the author of a brand new book called Boundary Boss, which actually, in fact, drops today. Now, over two decades, this girl's got experience. She's been working with a diverse group of clients, everyone from stay-at-home moms to celebrities and Fortune 500 CEOs really looking to achieve sustainable change. And she also, oh yeah, inspires a quarter of a million people weekly through her blog, her signature courses, her social media platforms, and her own popular podcast, The Terry Cole Show. So I'd like to welcome back to the Simplifiers podcast, Terry Cole. Hey, Terry. Hi, Mary. Thanks for that long intro. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's nice to hear about yourself. You sometimes forget all the amazing things that you have done. <laughs> and, and so it's nice to say it out loud. And the last time you and I spoke, I was looking back in our archives, was December 2019. That was episode 95, How to Invite Real Love Back into Your Life. Now, a lot has changed <laughs> since 2019. Let's just say yeah. that for the record, right? How was 2020 for you? <sighs> mm. Well, honestly, incredibly busy mm. because I was writing a book. Yeah. My mom was uh, going through cancer treatment, and I'm happy to say she's okay. Good. But it was hell to be doing all of that at the same time. But you know what is what what I really learned? A, I actually learned the name of the book is Boundary Boss. Yeah. And I learned how that that it's almost like right up until the end, you teach what you most need to learn. Where yes. I was strengthening my boundaries, setting limits with people. You had to I had to do it in order to support my mom because she moved in with my husband and I yeah. for about four months to support my mother and be able to get the book done on time required me saying no to lots and lots of things that I normally say yes to, that I like to say yes to. But I, I really had to become a boss about it, and I did. So I really did learn something in the process. Mm. And then a pandemic happened, which threw everything, a whole world went upside down. You know, and that's what I think is so fascinating about the pandemic. If we look at it from kind of the 50,000 foot view of it all, it was a global catalyst. It was a wake up call in many ways for a lot of us. What is your take on that? Oh, yeah. I've actually written quite a bit about this because I'm so fascinated by this um, global universal pushing of the pause button yeah. that so many folks would never do. Most of us would never do, and certainly not to the extreme, that we did do it. And yet there are so many beautiful stories, and of course, tragic and horrible stories as well. But in looking at my clients and the women in my courses, to see what people experienced from sort of being forced to slow down. Yeah. Like what shifted in their lives? What what time did they spend with their children? What time did they spend with their spouses? And of course, we've seen publicly and I've seen privately in my practice, you know, so a lot of relationships mm. got better, closer, and a lot of relationships just imploded because they were not the the foundation could not they could tolerate seeing each other one hour a day, but like twenty four seven for ten months, no. Yeah. So it was it was interesting to see and how how our minds changed about the way things quote unquote had to be. Mm -hmm. I guess not. I, I guess it doesn't have to be. And I guess you can have television shows without the in person audience. And I guess you know what you can also just do it from your frigging couch mm. because we're all online. And if you watch any of the nighttime shows or any of the the shows that have come back, they're, they've become so innovative. They're mm. just like, okay, I, I guess we're going to do this and we got to do it safely. But I've in, really enjoyed seeing the masks, you know, 
not not you know forget the double entendre i'm not talking about the other masks although mm. i like them too yeah. but i mean the emotional masks that we wear and when we're in this habituated um scheduling those masks stay in place yeah and there was something about you know stephen colbert or uh, you know um trevor noah you know, you're not there with hair and makeup people. You're not, you're literally there with like your two kids and your wife, if, in Colbert's case, and you are producing a show. Yeah, still having on to On your do. own. And what they're showing of themselves mm. is without all of the other big production stuff, I thought the quality was better than it had been. So anyway, yeah. I, I'm super fascinated by the changes, Mare. Yeah, I'm no, I think you're onto something. There's two things that you said there that really stick out to me. One is is just that, the the when you strip back all the noise, all the things in life that we believe are true, we strip back to a, a, a deeper level of authenticity with ourself and potentially with the world, if we give ourselves permission to show that outwards. But then the second thing that you said is, is, you know, just realizing that there's not everything that you thought you needed, the overscheduling, the busy, the, the running in the rat race, go faster, faster, harder, harder, may not be true. <laughs> and, and, you know, you start to realize and reprioritize what you spend your time on, um, both in your business, but also in your non-work life, right? Absolutely. And, and again, it was a wake up call that maybe we didn't schedule. We definitely didn't schedule. Mm. And yet, even with scary things happening, yeah, that we change, we we grow, we adapt because as humans we're so adaptive. And I think it's valuable to look and say, well, what changed? What is um, where's the gem in this craps too? Yeah of self-wisdom, of yeah. learning, of evolving, which, again, not bypassing what was hard, not bypassing what was bad, painful, people lost loved ones. I mean, there yeah. was a lot of suffering, obviously, that has come and that is still happening right now. And yet, I feel like in life, it's kind of our job to go, okay, but what did I learn about myself? Mm, yeah, it's a deepening of, of identity and deepening of, of core values and beliefs. And I suppose that there has been a, a re-examining, right? Like going, okay, well, that maybe served me to that point, And now I'm releasing that anchor and growing and, and believing other things. So I want to bridge the gap uh, on what we're talking about here, this releasing of past core beliefs and moving towards a, a deepening of identity, deepening of n where we are now um, and, and how we bring this to how we set boundaries. So why do you think it's so hard and what are the common myths that women believe when they're setting boundaries? Why is this so tricky for women? Well, I think the common myths are that people are going to think I'm a bitch or I have to be mean. To have healthy boundaries means I have to be confronting everyone and rejecting people and saying no all the time and and that it make means um, I have to be aggressive. Mm. Um, I have to be rejecting. These are all things that we culturally we are we are taught to not want to be, but the real deal is that it's not actually true. Mm -hmm. But there is a fear. We have been raised and praised, most of us, for being self abandoning codependents. I mean, mm -hmm. come on. Yeah. And, and having niceness, quote unquote, I'll put quotes on that, <laughs> being like the virtue above all others. Yeah. And yet in reality, when we really look at what happens when we are not a boundary boss, when we have not mastered this art of clearly communicating what is okay with us and what is not okay with us, right? Yeah. It's a super simple Brene Brown definition of boundaries. What are we doing? When we say yes, when we want to say no, are we being super nice? No, we just want to be perceived as being nice. But what we're really doing is misleading people, mm. giving people bad intel about who we actually are. We are sort of um, abandoning our own 
even if it's just our own preferences. Yeah. Right. Where how many women do you know and how often in your own life have you been like, I'm easy, no fuss, no muss, you know me, it's all good. Mm -hmm. And I want to be like, is it? Why is having no opinion good? Or why is not prioritizing your preference good? Why is it viewed as like a pain in the butt to say, you know what? I actually had pizza yesterday. I really don't feel like having that for dinner. Can we do something else? That's literally just asserting yourself. But what you're doing in the process is allowing people in your life to authentically know you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it makes me think of uh, just being a a good girl, you know, Uh, how you were raised as a child, you know, oh, just be a good girl, don't speak up, you know, don't act out, blah, blah, blah. And there's that that kind of just nonsense that I remember. I mean, I was a kid of the 70s and 80s. That was certainly, I I lived in a pink kind of room and my brother had GI Joes and all the things, right? So I don't know, is that stuff happening now with parents? I mean, I have kids and I'm very well aware of, of genderizing my responses or what I'm saying. And so I'm very sensitive to it. But do you think that that's still happening now with other parents? Well, here's the thing. I wrote this book, really, for for women, humans of all ages, but it, it's geared towards women because that is, I am a female empowerment expert. Yeah. And we are of an age where we do have kids. And even if we're being aware of it, how are these outdated, mm. um, unconscious belief systems still working to our detriment in our adult lives. Yeah. So I almost think it's less about, I mean, yes, I'm praying and I believe that this book will help stop the cycle yeah. of this, you know, giving our daughters and sons the disease to please others because it is not ultimately pleasing. Mm. But I'm really talking about those of us, women, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s, who we're left with sort of the toxic fallout of these unconscious belief systems that are basically hidden Mm. in the basement, right? I I call your unconscious mind, like the basement of your mind. Yeah. And it's so much, so much of the time women come to me, whether it's in my practice or whether it's in my courses and they're like, I don't, I'm, I'm unfulfilled. Like I don't get it. I have all the things. I have, I'm in a good marriage, you know, financially on track. Kids are doing good. Why Mm. am I thinking, uh, hi, is this all there is? Because that's the way that I feel. And part of that is that when we do all of this emotional labor, when we are keeping the ship of our lives and our kids' lives and our spouses' lives going, the whole house, it's not like a household, like friggin' runs itself because it doesn't. It's not (laughs) like the toilet paper replaces itself because it doesn't. And when we prioritize everyone else's needs above our own, what I find is that you're left feeling empty because the question, is this all there is? I can tell you the answer is uh, no. Mm -hmm. And that it's a much more fulfilling experience. When you master this art of boundaries, Mm -hmm. when you become fluent, when you raise your boundary IQ, as I like to say, but I I want women to think of this as an actual language. So you don't have to shame yourself like, why am I not fluent in Mandarin? Mm. You know what? To be fluent in Mandarin and to be fluent in boundaries, you need someone to teach you. You need the basics. You need a step-by-step process like, oh, this is the beginning. Oh, and now I learn this and then I learn this. And then I slowly but surely make small changes in my relationships that will really add up to massive transformation, but it isn't like you're going to suddenly be a different person and it's not like you need to have know this, like that a lot of women are like, what's wrong with me? Mm. Why is it so hard for me to say no when I want to say no? Yeah. Why can't I accept help? This is another disordered boundary experience. Mm. Why am I doing it all alone? Why am I exhausted? Why do I overgive to other people and then I'm bitter? Like these are all examples of disordered boundaries. Yeah. So 
I really want to dive deep into what you call the boundary blueprint, the how. But before we get there, talk to us about, um, as you're writing this book and doing this, the research and listening to your clients, like what is happening on the, the psychological side, like the underbelly of this, of why we don't sometimes set those boundaries for ourselves? Well, the boundary blueprint itself basically is uh, um, a configuration, right? This this is a paradigm in the unconscious of your mind mm. that really was, was planted in childhood, not intentionally or unintentionally. It's just how it is, where yeah. we learn from our family of origin, the culture we grew up in, mm. the country we grew up in, the, the socioeconomic class we grew up in, yes. we all had rules of engagement. We all learned how to relate to boundaries from other flawed human beings. And within family systems, what ends up happening with your boundary blueprint is that it gets handed down from one generation to the next. Like, this is how we behave. This is how we relate in relationships. This is how it is, as opposed to, this is just how we've done it which is actually what it is, right? So if you don't reveal, and, and part of the process of the book, a big part of it is revealing your unique boundary blueprint because yours, you know, Mary and mine, totally different because we all have these different familial experiences right. and, you know, configuration of families and all of that stuff. Mm. So the first thing we do is reveal what it is. So then you have conscious choices to go, oh, hmm. that's really, see, my mother was passive aggressive when she had something negative to express and when she wanted us to know her displeasure. Oh, but I don't have to do it that way. I just realized I can actually use direct communication mm. and say what's on my mind. And you may be listening to this and going, no, I don't do that. I promise you, you answer those questions. I've got some really powerful questions. It's a pretty extensive thing in the book itself, but we could do a couple of the yes, please. We could do a couple of the lighter ones. Yeah, where we all swear we're not gonna do whatever mistakes we think our folks made. We're definitely not doing them. But here's the thing: if there is no intervention it really does become our default unless we put a lot of energy and bandwidth into saying, for some folks they go, uh, you know, my, my dad was an alcoholic, let's say. Mm. So then they just don't drink at all, mm. right? So mm -hmm. that's different than this because you don't know how you're going to behave in a parenting situation uh, until you're in a parenting situation. Yeah. And if you've revealed all of the corrupted boundary data that our family lovingly passed on to us, and again, in the book and in my teachings, we're not blaming your parents. We're, literally, we're not blaming anyone. We assume everyone did the very best they could yep. with the consciousness they had at the time, right? Like, right. it isn't that. But we are now the grown-ups who are responsible not only for what is in our boundary blueprint, but we're also responsible for what we are teaching the next generation about boundaries. But see, that's what I think is really interesting, Terry, is um, so I'm 43 at the time of this recording. And sometimes we forget that we're the grown up and that we actually have the power to change these things because they're so deep rooted uh, as anchors or, or, or core beliefs. We think, well, that is that. And that's, that's that, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's, it, it requires conversations like this. It requires books in the world. It requires these nudges from the universe that sometimes you just have to slap yourself across the face because you've heard it a thousand times, but maybe today's conversation is the thousand and one for people to go, Oh, but actually I am a grown up. Actually, I can make this change. Maybe yeah. this is possible, right? Absolutely. And also knowing that this is something you can do, just one next right action at a time. Yeah. So it is, I, I built the entire book on my five pillars of transformation. So it's basically like we start with the awareness. So much of what I do is about raising awareness, right? Because we can't change mm. that which we're unaware, anything we're in denial of. Mm. So we start with awareness, then we move into self-knowledge where we're really excavating this information from the basement 
of your mind. And again, some of this stuff, not exactly super fun, which is why a lot of people don't do it. Right. But you can do it, right? So we have self-knowledge and then we move into self-acceptance because this pillar is difficult because our grown-up selves, a lot of times, we want to protect our parents. We're like, they're amazing though. Come on. They were only 19 when they started having kids. I mean, I could <laughs> say that about my my folks, right? Yes. And what I want to say about that is that by going back and by going into the basement and by excavating this stuff, we're this is literally not we're not saying anything about your folks, but it is the truth about what you experienced. And the yeah. only way to heal and the only way to gain new skills is by dealing with what is true yeah. and honoring those experiences. Because a lot of what we learned was painful, made us feel insecure, wasn't the best, right? Wasn't the best. So you can love, you, the adult you can love the grown-up parent if they're alive still, great. Yeah. But the child you is who needs you to go into the basement and find the truth about what you experienced so that she can relax and stop being like, hi, is anyone going to deal? Like, hi, why is nobody listening to me? Yes. Like she's constantly, that little kid is constantly pitching a fit, you know? Yes. So self-acceptance is three. Then we move into self-compassion, which can be the hardest one because I can't tell you how many clients have been like, come on, man, that was 40 years ago. I should be over it. Like, mm. how long am I going to hold on to this? I'm like, mm. uh, until you actually deal with it. That's right. how long. Right. That's exactly the amount of time. Honor. And then we can integrate. And then we can release. And then we build a new boundary blueprint based on what you want to create in your life, mm -hmm. based on the types of relationships that you're are worthy of you your most authentic self. Yeah. So I feel like there, there's this very laid out step-by-step -step process that I create in the book so that you cannot get it wrong. It's so like, here's step one. Yeah. Now you're going to do this. In the book, I have these things called back to you. Every concept that I go, okay, back to you. Here's some questions for you to think about right now. Because reading about this stuff is amazing and great and interesting. But what moves the needle, what changes something, is readers, listeners, anybody being able to go, oh, okay, that resonates for me in my life right now. Oh, my gosh. That is the beginning of transformation. Mm, yeah, I really love how you break it down in those five pillars. And I remember this from our previous conversation as well. I mean, I think that there is power in acknowledging processing the emotions and, and feelings and things that come up and then, you know, choosing a new thought. You can't hop, skip and jump over any of those steps as you have in the mm -hmm. five pillars. Like you can't just go straight to the end. You have to go systematically through it in order to really replace an old thought with a new thought, an old belief with a new one. So yes. And the, the way, hold on the fifth pillar, which I didn't say is self-mastery, yes. self-love, self-celebration. That's all in the fifth pillar. Okay. Yes. So let's, let's talk about some of those questions. If we were to do a little mini exercise of starting to rebuild that boundary blueprint, what questions would you would you have us answer? Well, you you would first say, just look overall how were boundaries handled in your family of origin? Yeah. Right? Was the family very enmeshed? Or was there was there it allowed that you be separate? Mm. Could you have a separate opinion? from the people in your crew or w was it like group think only <laughs> yeah and would you sort of be in trouble if you didn't agree um were you allowed to have separate space some people didn't because they didn't have it but that that's a physical right because mm -hmm. boundaries are not just emotional and what we talk about you have the categories of boundaries right we have physical boundaries emotional mental um their spiritual boundaries, sexual boundaries, yeah. and all of those things, if you look at your family of origin, right, were people allowed to just take your things? Mm. That's material boundaries. Yeah. Or was there respect and did someone have to ask? So that all of those, 
you can think about was one of your parents um, a people pleaser? Did you see, was it modeled behavior for you, yeah. someone saying yes when they wanted to say no? Mm. It's so interesting to think about how deep-rooted some of the stuff really can be. Um, and, you know, I encourage you, if you're listening to this conversation right now, press pause. Like, actually do the work that she's suggesting. Set a seven-minute timer, get a journal out, and actually answer that question that she posed. Go back, rewind, listen to it again, and set it all up. Again, all the n- things that we talk about in today's conversation are in our show notes at the simplifierspodcast.com as a resource for you as you go, go along and do the work. Because maybe that's it. Maybe the thousand times we've heard all this, we go, yeah, yeah, boundaries, good idea. And we don't do it. It's because we're not actually doing it. We're not actually Mm -hmm. um, giving ourselves permission and space to go deep. I wonder, and again, I can only speak for myself. Sometimes it's scary, Terry, to like pull the curtain back, to go deep into some very traumatic dark places from our childhood or, or otherwise early on? Is, is it just a fear of what you might uncover and that it might be too big, too scary, too deep to, to oh, I've got my next meeting in 30 minutes. There's no way I can do mm-hmm. that in this time. Do you think that there's something right. like that? I think it's a combination. Of course, there's fear. And as human beings, we want to avoid pain. Like We're mm-hmm. wired to avoid pain. And even if you didn't have an abusive background, what we discover about our parents, I mean, it's painful because the child in us wants them to be a particular way. Mm. And then you go back and you go, oh, yeah, that wasn't great. (laughs) That that, that wasn't helpful. That, That was painful to me. So I understand avoiding it, but I think that you can do it. The reason why I teach in very small baby steps, Mm. is that most people don't have time where they're like, I'm going to take off two months and just do this. So of course I do teach, you know, I teach courses on this um, and wrote an entire book about it, which you can take at your own pace. But I strongly suggest that you do take it at your own pace. But also realize, unless you have had untreated complex childhood trauma, so if you have had untreated complex childhood trauma, you need therapy. Mm, you yes. need a uh, uh, help. There are free places. We will give you some resources yes. in the show notes. So I just want to say that because it's important that there are particular things that going into the basement of your mind, if you haven't, that it's too scary, mm. right? So you don't want to re-traumatize yourself. You do want to do that with a professional. Right. But for those who that is not right, appropriate, that doesn't apply to you, you can do it one step at a time, Yeah, realizing that you're not alone in being afraid. And even just speaking up when you start to do it, one, and I always guide people to do it with lower priority people mm. to start with. Mm. We never start with our most important people because that's really scary. Right. We start with the mail carrier or the or hairdresser person or someone who we have a relationship with. Mm. But we start looking at the ways, the small ways that we don't um, prioritize or share our preferences because this is a part of boundaries. The myth people have is that boundaries are all about like saying no and all about being demanding. They're not. Mm. When When I'm talking about becoming a boundary boss, I'm talking about you learning how to share your preferences with ease And realizing that what you think, how you feel, and even simply what you prefer matters Mm. and is important. And that you are setting the bar in every relationship in your life. So if you treat yourself like how you feel, what you want, and your preferences don't matter because you would rather avoid any pushback that is so scary to end up in a conflict with someone or even to have someone disagree with you, that you have habitually learned to have no preferences. What you're really doing is denying people the pleasure of knowing the uniqueness that is you, 
those preferences make you you. And listen, you know, not all boundaries are of the same importance, right? So I break them into categories. You have preferences, you have desires, and you have deal breakers. You know, they're not all the same, right? With a preference, we can go, I don't want to feel like eating that tonight. And the other person goes, but I really, really want to, please. And then you go, okay. That that a preference is not a deal breaker. They're right. two different things. Yeah. A, a desire is a little more important where you might be the one who says, you know what, though, this is actually important to me. Mm. So I really need your support or I would really appreciate you. You know, I know I'm being difficult right now. I mean, I'm writing a book. I'm saying to my husband, hey, I know I have no bandwidth Mm. and I really appreciate you picking up the slack the way that you are. And I really need you to do these other seven things because I'm losing it and I cannot do them. And he's like, okay. But acknowledging, asking, negotiating, um, being appreciative, right? That That's more in the desire. And then the deal breakers, like we all have them and you got to honor them. But mm-hmm. a lot of the times, if we were raised in families where how we felt didn't matter, if we had, if it was dysfunctional, maybe it was parent-centric instead of child-centric, which is the healthy way. Mm-hmm. I don't mean the child dominates the family. Right. I mean... The, the the well-being of the child is at the top of the consideration, right? Mm. In dysfunctional family systems, the well-being or the desires or the wants of the dysfunctional parent is at the top. Mm. So the kids, right, as kids, we're so resourceful and smart, and we know exactly what we need to do, which is have no needs, which is to be a pleaser, make sure they get what they need so there's not going to be some kind of dramatic, traumatic, painful thing happening to the child. So those are lessons that they're they're deep. They're in there. So you may be doing that in your adult life, not because there's something broken about you, because you simply haven't learned that that war, that particular war is over, and that you no longer need to do that. That was an adaptive response in childhood, and it probably truly protected you. Mm, a coping it mechanism. Is, yes. Mm. And it has become maladaptive mm. in adulthood where it blocks deep intimacy and blocks people from knowing you, mm. you know? Yeah. You know, it's interesting how you broke it down like that, uh, preferences, desires, and deal breakers. I mean, even in just that simplicity, I, I hope that brings to mind people that are listening right now, what areas of your life could use some better boundaries when broken into those three categories. Um, is that part of building that blueprint, you know, like mapping that out on paper? Um, but then more importantly, how do we communicate that to our other people in our life, whether it's our partners, our kids, or even in the workplace with our clients and our coworkers and suppliers? Well, the beginning, another one of the exercises in the book is the, it's a very extensive list called the okay and not okay list. Mm. And we literally hit every single area of your life from the way you interact with coworkers at work to the lighting at work to the, like everything. Because when we're used to sometimes uh, sucking it up, We don't even realize all the areas that we are, what I call, Mm auto-accommodating. And it is friggin' exhausting and not satisfying and super unnecessary. So part of the the gift that I'm giving to your audience is about auto-accommodating, which Mm -hmm. if, I mean, I think it's kind of self-explanatory, but if not, is you see yourself in any situation and you are immediately like, well, I can do this and, or I can help in this way, or, well, I'm happy to switch seats with you. Or I'm like, we're just volunteering it, like falling over ourselves. And I know this obviously, because I am a recovering auto accommodator yeah. and it's still a daily practice. Trust me. Yeah. But I came, I came up with this, this theory, this thought, cause I was, this is before um, the pandemic and I was in my hair salon in Manhattan and I, it was very busy salon. And I was, 
waiting um, at the sink, right? But I had something in my hair where I w- it was going to be 15 minutes where I'm sitting at the sink and I saw a lot of people are coming and going. So I say to the person who was had put it on my hair, hey, I'm happy to sit somewhere else if yeah. you need the sink. Yeah. Now, and then she's like, no, we're good. We got it. And then I thought for the next 15 minutes while I was sitting there, like, wow, Tara, you can't even relax when you're getting your friggin' hair color done because you're too busy trying to better organize the sink flow yes. for this salon that doesn't need you to do it and doesn't want you to do it. And oh my God, stop. Yeah. So that was a realization. And then I was like, huh, if I'm doing this here, where else am I doing it? Yeah. And where else is everyone doing it yeah. if you have this personality type? And so I quickly put up a blog and it went viral and it had 130,000 views of the video in like 30, less than 30 days. And I was like, I knew I was onto something yeah. because we're so over it. Yeah. You know? So then the, the better alternative, and, and I'm chuckling because I've been in that situation, I don't know how many billions of times, right? <laughs> like you are dead on to something. Uh, I feel you. I see you. I'm there with you, girl. Uh, <laughs> well, what is the better response is instead of asking her, do you want me to move? It's just saying, I will, I'd like to move, right? Nope. It's, it's being really clear that it's not your side of the street. Uh, you don't know that they don't need those other seats more. Yeah. You don't know what the plan is, right? Yeah. It is to actually just keep my eyes on my own friggin' paper for a minute and have faith that the same way if I need something from you, Mary, mm. I'll ask you. Yeah. You'll never have to ask me if, if I seemed a little cold, was I mad? Mm. No, you know why? Because I will not express to you my displeasure at, about something yeah. by acting it out passively aggressively. Yeah. I will use words. I will say, hey, to your face, I'm upset. I felt hurt. Mm. I was confused. I was frustrated. So this is what I'm talking about, that when we don't do that, though, it's easy to think that, oh, they're not asking me to move because they're being nice, but we're just projecting right. <laughs> our crap onto other people. My feeling is, hi, let the salon run the run the sinks. They got it. They're good. They don't need me. They, and they don't need you. If you would actually, the only time you say, I'm moving to that other seat, is if you're uncomfortable at the sink That's and you may say, hey... Can I sit there? I'm uncomfortable, right. and I, it's going to be 15 minutes. And I would rather, and you know, and they say yes or no. Yeah. So it's talking true. That's mm. the subtitle of the book, right? The essential guide to talk true, be seen, and finally live free. But talking true can also be as simple as that example. So for the gift for your audience, that was like the longest way around the bar. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Get back to the gift, which is that I'm giving you ideas of how you can protect your incredibly precious energy, right? Your spirituality, like your internal self. Yeah. And there's those of us who are high, you know, highly sensitive folks, which is definitely me. Maybe you fall into the category of being an empath. So I'm giving you a really solid, it's like a 10 minute lesson and a beautiful guide of just ways that you can protect yourself and hold on to your energy instead of leaking it all over town, thinking you're doing a service to others when really you're not doing a service to anybody. Mm. And so that link is going to be in the show notes at the simplifierspodcast.com, but you can also find it at boundaryboss.me forward slash simplifiers. So all of that again is in the show notes. And you know what it made me think of Terry? And it's so like, duh, of course, Mary, uh, is that I do this with my kids. I, you know, I've been saying it with to them since they were a little bitty bitty and they, they make fun of me sometimes, but you just say, you know, just say with your outside voice what you want, need, desire. You can't just say it with your inside voice. You have to say it and, and with your outside voice. And it sounds silly, but it, it's exactly what you're talking about there, right? Yes, and it's actually really good training yeah. for kids because you're creating a sacred or a safe space mm-hmm. for them to express themselves. You're encouraging them to say, listen, it doesn't only have to be what mommy wants you to say, because many of us were raised like, 
Um, where's my smiley girl? Right. Turn that frown around. Right. Where there were certain emotions and experiences that were just, you knew would get you rejected mm. rather than get you the love of that parent, which of course is all we want. And so we learn to be, you wonder why there's all these people out there teaching this stuff and it's all hyper positivity bypassing, like everything happens for a reason. You're like, you know what is not helpful, Betty? <laughs> that <Yeah>. statement. <laughs> after my mother just got diagnosed with cancer or whatever, like just stop trying to make yourself feel better yeah. about my situation. Yeah. And how about I'm allowed to just be like, this sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it sucks. Yeah. We don't have to be like, but it's okay. And yet that is such a, an ingrained response for many of us who were raised to be good girls, as you had said at the top, Mayor. Mm, it's true. And, you know, applying it to a work situation, you know, going back to what we talked about at the beginning of like being afraid to be seen as a bitch or that fear of like, oh, well, the client's going to fire me if I set this boundary or whatever. How do you overcome that stuff? What, what, what would you give advice for there? Well, part of it is the, the more fluent you become in the language of boundaries. Mm. The, the less um, daunting it is. Part of why we have these exaggerated fears of speaking up is because we don't have the skills yet. Yeah. And I give you so many. Oh, actually, and in your in your the gift, I, I'm giving you some boundary scripts. Yeah. That's the third thing that Good. it was, was the boundary scripts. So that you go, okay, so this is like a sentence starter. I can make this my own because so much of the time we just don't say it because we have these exaggerated fears of what will happen. Yep. And then that makes the words just disappear. But think about something easy saying, you know what, Bob, I'd like to make a simple request that you not call me after hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So my business day ends at five. Yeah. So if you do call me after hours, my phone is off. Just know I will be getting back to you during my next business day, which starts at 9 a.m. the next right. day. Right, right. But we wait until Bob calls us after hours 44 times until we literally want to kill Bob. Mm -hmm. And then, without the good words, we're just like, Bob, who the hell does Bob think he is? Mm -hmm. What do you think? You're my friend, Bob. You're not. Yes. Like, we yeah. can just go crazy. Yeah. And you know? unless you're a brain surgeon who is planning on doing Bob's brain surgery at nine o'clock tonight, I'm guessing <laughs> Bob does not need to talk to you right now. You know I mean? Like it, it, it's a funny thing, but it is so true. I know a lot of our listeners are wedding planners and they let their clients walk all over them in that, oh. that sense of like, well, if I give her my cell number, then she knows that I've got her back, but her wedding's not for four more months. Why is she calling oh. you at nine o'clock at night? Do you know that's <laughs> the thing. That's a clear right, but, example. But this is the whole thing about clean agreements, mm, mm -hmm. which is also a whole boundary thing yes. is that we set ourselves up to fail. Oh my God. All the time. You know why? Because we don't have clean agreements. We don't have proactive, like there's a whole section in the book. And when I teach about proactive boundary plans, yes. which is knowing who the heck are you dealing with? You know the boundary bullies in your life right now. Yes. I don't want you to name them, Mary. But we all could literally, listeners, bring to mind someone who you're like, oh, they're definitely a boundary bully. You come up with an, a, a hardcore plan to approach them a particular way based on what you know about them, yeah. based on the evidence that you have from the past. So not all. So there's three categories of the way that we, we set up boundaries with people. You have your first timers. It's people you've never done it with before. You may think they're a boundary bully, but hey, man, if you've never said anything to Bob, mm -hmm. you're just not drawing boundaries. Right. He may not be a bully. He literally might just be toned up or doesn't know. Yeah. So that's one. And then we have the, the repeat offenders, where you have said the boundary thing, but they seem to like selectively forget that you said it. Yep. And then there's a whole other category of boundary destroyers. It's literally a whole chapter in the book. And this is a lot of people with the, um, you know, personality disorders could be in there, narcissistic personality disorder, could be bipolar, like the cluster yeah. B personality disorders. It's not just them, but it could be them. Yeah where all of the things that you learn about how to deal with other people, the rules don't apply. 
to those people. So you do have to learn a different way of protecting yourself and your boundaries with boundary destroyers. But just know there's no one size fits all. And whatever is the right way for you to do it, I promise you, if you're listening, if you're watching, if you have a desire, you can learn. Because I am so honored to teach you. Mm. I think there's so much to this, Terry, and I feel like we could talk for ages. Um, <laughs> I genuinely do, and I, I feel maybe we need to bring you back for a part three at some point, uh, <laughs> because I feel that, that there is a deeper level um, with you know family members, that like spouses or kids or parents who we just can't remove from our life entirely. We can't fire them, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately. Um, <laughs> and but we they do. They are those boundary destroyers. They no matter how many times you tell them, it they seem to constantly uh, overstep their bounds or do the things that trigger the most. Like. What advice would you give that person asking for a friend here, obviously? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, part of it is that you you have to be aware that if you've already been down this road with this person, that the first thing to think about is stepping back a bit, mm. is really assessing who is this person? What have they shown me yeah. that they're either capable of or willing to do. Mm. Because a lot of times we really are actually dealing with people who have a limitation. So as much as we may wish they could be more evolved, we may wish they could take us into consideration, we may want all of those things. They just may not be able to. Now, I'm not saying that you, you need to give up, and I'm not saying go no contact with all of those people in your life. But I am saying that your your first order of business is to take a real inventory of your past experiences with asserting yourself with that particular person. What are the tactics that they employ? How do they respond? Mm. Do they guilt you? Yeah. Do they shame you? Do they withdraw in anger and don't respond to you? What What is their way? Because sometimes, and it depends, if the person has been violent in the past. Now, that's a whole other conversation because right. your safety must be the absolute top, top priority always. So in that situation, if drawing a boundary you think might incite someone to be violent, then no. And then you really got to rethink why are you still in that relationship with someone who you think asserting yourself will inspire violence. Mm -hmm. But again, that is where a professional, you need to make a safe plan yeah. to leave. You need to protect yourself. And if you, if you have children, do that as well. Again, not minimizing, not saying it's easy. It is not. Yeah. But if that isn't the case, but they're just super dramatic, they're just going to make a lot of noise. They're just going to suck your bandwidth and make you feel so guilty that you're like, God, that wasn't even worth it. Then you're starting to see the limitations yeah. of that person. And if they're able, listen, with regular, let's say moms, like my own mom, in my 30s, let's say, having to say to her, listen, mom, I'm not asking you for advice. I love you and I'm in pain. And if you can't be with where I am, I just won't share these things with you. I've asked you before. Yeah. You continue to give me advice I don't want and I'm not taking. Maybe eventually, but not right now, because right now I'm crying and in pain. In the beginning, she she would be like, um, "Okay, all right, well, I, you know, I'm, I just want to help." I'm like, "Right, but I've, I'm telling you, it's not helping. Yeah, it makes me feel like I'm a problem. You think you can solve, but yes. you can't. I'm a grown up. It's my life. I'll handle it. Can you just be my mother and care that I'm in pain?" That's hard for you. Maybe you can't do it, and that's okay. And if you can't, I won't come to you. Mm. And I wasn't really threatening. I was telling the truth, you know? Mm. And then eventually, after, you know, protesting and saying, oh, all you girls, because I have three sisters, you could talk to me about anything, but, like, I can't say anything. I'm like, listen, you can say what you want to them. I'm telling you what you can't say to me. Yeah. And, maybe, and she got it, you know? Yeah, and maybe, maybe it is just a human... Um, 
desire to want to solve the want to put things in pretty packages and feel like it's okay. And I've, I've helped, I've done my bit and now I can move on. And I think that there is the people that are boundary destroyers in my life are constantly looking to solve Mm. my ish when all I'm asking is just to hold space. And I think that's what you're saying there too. I am. And you know what? I give lots of scripts where you can set the people in your life up to succeed Mm. instead of fail by asking for what you want. I started saying to my mother, mom, I'm going to share something with you. I'm not asking for input. I really just need you to hold space for where I am right now. So Mm. can you please do that? Mm. Now she knows. Don't give me any advice. (laughs) So I have two bits of homework for everyone that's listening. One is take this episode, share it with that person, because I think the last 10 minutes are are words that those people need to hear, and you need to be able to do the scripts and recognize and rehearse and and all that. That's part one of your homework. Part two is pick up this book. The book is called Boundary Boss, The Essential Guide to Talk True, Be Seen, and Finally Live Free. And like we said at the top of the show, it is now available in bookstores wherever you get your books, either online or at your local bookshop. And I think that this is the thing. If this is a thing that really is blocking your life, or has been um, something you've pushed aside and thought, well, I'll deal with that later when I've got time. There's never going to be when I've got time. This is the time to focus on it and really, truly make a break, break through to the next side. Yes. So Terry, I have a couple of questions as we wrap up. Um, And thank you again for sharing your wisdom, your heart, and your time with us today. I believe that simplicity and gratitude go hand in hand. Tell me, what's one thing you're grateful for today? That my mother is cancer-free. Yeah. How old is your mom? 83. Wow. Gosh, goodness gracious. I am grateful for that as well for you. So tell me, what's one book or blog that you're reading these days that's either inspiring you or poking holes and challenging your belief system? Um, I have a great book that I love. It's called Sex Points Mm. by Dr. Batsheva Marcus, who is a PhD, and she is a women's sexual health expert. She has the Mays Clinic, M-A-Z-E, which is in Manhattan and in Westchester, New York. And she is really blowing up um, stereotypes around sexuality. And if anyone is struggling with hormones after having kids or Mm. lack of libido or um, menopause, which is hell, P.S., just so you know. Um, Anyway, thank God I'm through it now, but wow, it was so much. That's how I found her, was my own going through menopause. I was like, wow, nobody tells you how much this sucks, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. But I love this book. It has so many great resources, and it is so – she is – you want to talk about a someone who is talking true. Mm. That is Dr. Batsheva Marcus. Mm, Thank you for that. Yes, we will put a link in the show notes for her so you can check out that book. Tell us who's one person in your network, somebody that you know personally, you just feel is up to brilliant things. We could shine a spotlight on him and who knows, maybe we'll have him on the podcast one day. I love um, a newer friend of mine in the past year. Her name is Tori Aletto. And she is a therapist. And on Instagram, you can find her at New York Therapist. I think it's New York Therapist Mm -hmm. is her handle. Yep. Um, And she's just, she is putting out so so much thought-provoking, original thoughts around the way we relate to ourselves, self-love, emotional self-regulation, stuff I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. But she's got a beautiful skill of taking these heady things and just making them very accessible. And every two weeks she does webinars. With just Her stuff is very simple. Like she doesn't have like an elaborate anything, but such great quality. So if you're inter- into like mental health stuff, mm. she's someone who's very interesting. Brilliant. We will link her up in the show notes. If you guys are curious about her, you can find her there at the simplifierspodcast.com. And I encourage you, wherever you're listening to this podcast, flip over and do a search for The Terry Cole Show. Subscribe there as well, because then you get this beautiful voice in your earbuds all the time. And you can get these little, t- simple, bite sized episodes from Terry um, that help, again, point you to the right direction, point you to new anchors of beliefs and, and thought patterns. 
and setting those boundaries that actually stick. Her website is terrycole.com and all of her show, social media links are in our show notes as well. So Terry, my final, final question for you today, and again, thank you so much for your time. Someone somewhere is listening to us right now and it has been a rough go. 2020 was not pretty and 2021, whew, hard, hot mess. She's looking to set boundaries. She doesn't even know where to begin. What's one thing you could whisper into her ears right now just to encourage her in this moment? You can do it. Mm. I got you. And I have so much free stuff out there too. And yes, I wrote a whole book. You can get that. And I'm giving you guys a free gift. But go to my YouTube channel. There's 400 videos. You don't need money. You just need the desire. And I promise you, you can do this and I will be there every step of the way to guide you. Mm, Big love to you, Terry. Right back at you, Mary. Thank you. 